Um, yes, always. You know, I, I, you know, I think once you've achieved a high level of command and uh, technique, you know, you use that technique in whatever music you play, whether it's complex music and difficult to play, or whether it's simple music. So I think, uh, regardless of the style of music, you benefit from good technique, and I can always apply it in any style. Yeah, for sure. I don't actually. I never did. Never did. No. Um, Some kind of rumor. Yeah, it's a rumor. I never did bodybuilding. I, I like to stay fit, mm -hmm. and I like to work out, but I never did any bodybuilding. I, I play. I'm genetically predispositioned to be bulky. My father was a decathlete, mm -hmm. an Olympic uh, decathlete. So maybe it's a genetic thing. I don't know. If I work out, I get very bulky very quickly. Mm -hmm. But I never did any uh, bodybuilding whatsoever. Uh, I used to do a lot of martial arts and mm -hmm. other sports, but not bodybuilding. Yeah. I'm but bigger than I used to be, yeah. for sure. Yes, and that it comes from. Working out, and I, I guess with age, for some reason, with me, it's not a bodybuilding. Uh, uh, <laughs> I don't know why that is. Good question. I guess it's a pretty a genetic thing. I don't know, but I do work out. I try not to worry about it. You know, when I when I'm on the road for a long period of time, I eat a lot of really crappy food, mm -hmm. and I eat at weird times, and you know, uh, it's impossible to to keep that shake it under control it's impossible so I don't worry about it mm -hmm. you know I, I try to have the balance I, I try to not tour too much so when when I'm at home I mm -hmm. try to eat healthily and and uh, regularly and eat the you know the really top quality food all the time so it's a balance you know on a tour it's pizzas and beers all the time so <laughs> you drink beer <laughs> of course oh. so I don't worry about it you know. Fuck off, all of you guys who do that. <laughs> <laughs> no, seriously, it's stealing yeah, and uh, it it's not a petty crime. Mm -hmm. It's expensive to make these videos. Uh, it takes a lot of preparation, a lot of competence, a lot of extremely hard work to do these things. So anybody who thinks they deserve to have it for free uh, is a fucking asshole. And uh, they should be prosecuted, you know, they should be punished. Um, you know, and the problem is people don't understand that whatever they steal, they steal from out of their own pockets in the future. Any musician who's out there who's trying to learn something, he should be willing to make some sort of sacrifice for gaining that information from a competent teacher. Mm -hmm. And even if the sacrifice is just whatever, 30 euros or whatever it is, 20 bucks of buying a DVD, mm -hmm. uh, everything else is, is not acceptable for me. The problem is that by stealing and, and, and illegal downloading and illegal sharing, mm -hmm. they take re revenue away from the artist, from the artist's publisher and from the publishing company and from the management companies, from the production companies, from the record companies and everybody else, which are all the companies and the infrastructure that that musician who's stealing that needs in the future mm -hmm. to get his own deal, to get his own tour, to get his own management, to get his own record release. So the money they're not spending is money they're eventually also not getting themselves. Mm -hmm. They're just making it harder for themselves because they're damaging the industry, and uh, and it's it's a vicious circle. You know, it comes back around to them. No, it's not. Do you get any ro royalties? Of course, like yeah. I mean, it's not true. There are many more ways to monetize mm -hmm. the sale of music and distribution. Of, uh, it, distribution of music is much easier. Promotion, marketing of music is much easier. You can be a lot more independent today. Those are all bonuses. And also, there are new ways to monetize uh, music uh, sales and, and get money like from, I don't know, whether it's uh, Google advertisements or whether it's YouTube advertisements or whether it's you know sh uh, clicks on YouTube. Mm -hmm. um, and of course, your own distribution. Uh, you can sell records very easily today without a publishing deal, without a record deal on CD Baby or Amazon or uh, iTunes. whatever, iTunes. So there, it's, it has bonuses and, and uh, good sides and bad sides to it. It's not necessarily all a, good, a bad thing. And I don't think that the music industry is dead at all. I mean, there's plenty of money for everybody still. Uh, it's just a different kind of distributing the money and, and monetizing music. I did, yeah. Do you still play in much uh, traditional people? Sometimes. 
the surgery I had was on my right hand. Mm -hmm. uh, I had carpal tunnel decompression surgery. Um, and I have the same problem on my left hand. And I changed my grip because of that, partially because of that. Mm -hmm. And I still play traditional grip sometimes, but I wanted to change my grip anyways, regardless of the carpal tunnel. I wanted to um, have a challenge, you know, and change the most important, most fundamental aspect of my technique, mm -hmm. which is the grip, just to, you know, have a fresh breeze in my playing, create something of a challenge, and also change the way I think about drumming and the way I set up the drums and everything else. I mean, I wanted to just change things, including my drums and, uh, you know, the whole configuration and my setup and technique, everything. I got really bored with the way I was playing, mm -hmm. so I changed something very fundamental about mm -hmm. it. And, um, and the, the surgery was part of that process to improve things and, 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 and um, but I still play traditional grip occasionally, mm -hmm. mainly when I'm playing for drummers, uh, just to show some you know, traditional drumming styles and techniques and it's a bit of a tribute to mm -hmm. drumming tradition. But for everything else, uh, all the work that I do, I, I use only match grip now. I, uh, the therapy was 30 days. I had actually less, I think it was 22 days or something like that. But I, four weeks after the surgery, I was playing again. So it was very quick, very easy. I had a great hand surgeon in Los Angeles. And uh, so the rehabilitation was really quick, just over three weeks. Very, very easy. Well, mm -hmm. yeah. what do you think about it? Um, let's. Um, did you really prepare, or was it like spontaneous? No, I did prepare. I learned mm -hmm. the music. Um, I didn't know the songs before, so I had to learn them. Mm -hmm. And uh, it was it, all in all, it was a positive experience. Uh, you know, whether you like sort of the background information or not, I, for me personally, it was a it was a positive experience, and you know, I had a good time playing. Um, and you know, it's I. There is a lot of speculation and what have you about this whole thing. My opinion is they just did what they were able to do, you know, at this point, and I don't think they could have gotten seven world-class drummers to play Dream Theater music for free mm -hmm. unless they called it an audition, you know. <laughs> so um, it was the cheapest way for them to get all these guys in one room and, and play Dream Theater music and film it, you know. Because otherwise it would have cost them a lot of money, which they don't have. <laughs> but uh, it's it was a fun experience, you know. I, I have no regrets or anything like that. Did you have and a chance to meet all the other guys? Well, oh sure. Oh yeah, they're all friends of mine, anyways. Mm -hmm. I mean, uh, you know, I've been friends with Virgil for many years. Mm -hmm. We shared a studio together, you know, many years ago already. And I'm good friends with Derek and with Achilles and everybody. I mean, we're all you know in the same world of work and in the same line of work, and we meet each other all the time. And mm -hmm. we've been very close friends with some of the guys, especially with uh, Virgil and Derek, uh, and also Marco. I've been friends with for many, many years. So yeah, I mean, we all knew it, you know each other before, and we were communicating even before the fact about the audition. And uh, uh, yeah, it was. Uh, bunch of friends trying you know basically doing the same thing and of course talking about it beforehand and after and uh, you know it's all good I think I'm glad that they found somebody and uh, you know good luck to Mike and I obviously worked out for him it's fantastic well I do see talented players mm -hmm. and not so talented players I also see not so talented players that are extremely diligent and work very hard. And, you know, I see talented players who are terrible because they don't work hard enough. You know, I see everything, but I don't see any geniuses. Mm -hmm. No, I, there's, there's only hard work, really. I don't believe in that sort of uh, mysterious, you know, talent. They wait talks to Yeah, to there's see. no such thing. It's a, it's, a, it's a myth. There's only hard work and there's passion and love for music. And if you love music and you feel passionate for music, then you tend to play and practice more often. And simply that fact makes all the difference. You know, mm -hmm. it's really just hard work. And and I do meet a lot of people uh, and young students at my camps who are extremely dedicated and loving music and drumming and great players. 
and then other people who are you know doing it for fun and maybe they're even professionals but they don't work as hard and you can hear it you know it's it's always mm -hmm. very obvious it's yeah I think it's possible yeah maybe you know I think in order to play music not just drums but any kind of music or, or, or you know in a, in a great way it doesn't necessarily mean that you have to be technically perfect or super advanced you can play beautiful music with no technique at all and you can write a great song with little experience but with a lot of you know, meaningful words and uh, and a lot of emotion and, mm -hmm. and honestly, I think you can do great things without being a perfect musician. Uh, will you be, you know, technically perfect starting at 25? Maybe when you're 70, yes, mm -hmm. <laughs> if you practice occasionally, you know. <laughs> but it's difficult. If you start very late, I think you can still become a great musician. But it takes a lot of hard work uh, and a lot of dedication. And I believe in the 10,000 hour rule, you know, there's yeah. a, you know, if you do invest that kind of time, yes, you will reach sort of an, an, a level of excellence mm -hmm. after 10,000 hours. I, I believe in that. Well, my first teacher, uh, when I was when I just turned five, uh, was a classical uh, percussionist. He was the uh, chair of the uh, Vienna Symphonic Orchestra, so a very accomplished classical player, very strict, very old school, authoritarian sort of teacher, mm -hmm. but also a very good teacher, you know. And um, I owe a lot to him because he taught me how to practice first. Mm -hmm. In my first four weeks of learning the instrument, he didn't teach me how to play, he taught me how to practice first. At every lesson, he taught me about practice rules, about uh, focus, concentration, and how to really practice efficiently. And then, after I understood the concept of practicing, he taught me how to play. And every time I would go home to practice after a lesson, I knew exactly what to do. And that has helped me throughout my whole drumming career and saved me a lot of time. I mean, literally thousands of hours of wasted practice time. So I'm very grateful to him. And um, after that, I had a whole variety of different teachers uh, in Vienna at the conservatory, uh, at the music academy, and then a lot of private lessons from different people. So I think that a, um, a teacher is still today, although we have all the YouTube and online schools and whatever, I think having a good teacher and one-on-one -on -one lessons is the most important and the fastest and most efficient way to learn and get better and develop. Okay, some, some silly questions. Yeah, okay. uh, I like those. <laughs> Some questions you, that you have to answer without thinking a lot of them. Without thinking a lot, okay. I never think a lot. So. Okay. Shoot. <laughs> well, uh, th I would say 30. <laughs> because... No, tell me how. I mean, there's many variations in this show. I know it takes us, you know, whatever, 10 and, you know, one is actually doing it and nine is saying, it's, you know, how Dave Wakel would have done it much better. Chicks. Chicks. Yeah. <laughs> yeah, great. It's the same. Yeah. <laughs> The best players, the best players, <laughs> players. Most oh, most uh, the dumbest, dumbest in the band. Yeah. Is that true? Yeah. Or not? <laughs> well, uh, since I also play bass, I have to say no. <laughs> um, <laughs> no. Okay, okay. Slayer wins. <laughs> <laughs> uh, to my girlfriend, if she was a drummer. Uh, hmm. Kill Bill? Uh, let me think, that's a good question. She's a drummer. <laughs> mm, that's a good question. I'd find great musicians for her to play with. That's cool. Yeah. I never tried. <laughs> I'm sure there's a there's a time nerd out there who's tried. I don't know. <laughs> I can't speak from experience. Absolutely. A lot less wind resistance, of course, yes. It's like shaving your legs when you ride a bicycle. <laughs>
<laughs> you should also always shave your legs when you try to play fast bass drums. You're definitely faster. <laughs> Just like Lance Armstrong. <laughs> Drums bleed. <laughs> <laughs>